All right, great. Thank you, Leslie. Welcome everyone to the IWBC celebration of the Negro League Centennial. For the IWBC, diversity, inclusion, access, and opportunity in baseball has been at the very core of everything we do from the very beginning. So when we get a chance to honor people who have broken down barriers, we always do. Whether a group's exclusion is based on gender or race, or unfortunately in some cases both, it is wrong and it is all too frequent. But know this, nowhere at any time did any person of color just accept no for an answer when they showed up at a baseball field. Instead, they persisted. And for them to overcome that kind of prejudice to get to be part of this game, it took tremendous courage, strength, and determination. This year, we celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Negro Leagues, the organized leagues where men and women of color played, coached, owned the teams. This anniversary is so very important and deserves every second of recognition we can muster. But in doing so, let's not forget the long history of African-American men and women who were part of baseball long before the 1920s. They have always been there at every milestone from the makeshift dusty fields of the 19th century to artificial turf from the game before gloves to, to a time when it takes paid employees to handle the equipment. From its beginning, African-American men and women have always been part of baseball. So this year, as we celebrate this important centennial of the Negro Leagues, honor those who built those leagues and for the brilliant baseball they played. But remember, they stood on the shoulders of greatness too. The history of African-Americans in baseball is long. Their legacy handed down to us through centuries of oppression and exclusion should be a guide for those of us who continue to demand inclusion and equal opportunity. Today, we honor them and we thank them for the examples they set and for the foundation they built. And I ask you all, to join me as we tip our collective hats to the men and women of the Negro Leagues and the long, long history of African Americans in baseball. I hope you're all tipping your caps, metaphorical or otherwise. You are about to see a video that it has been put together uh, as a celebration to honor the Negro Leagues. We are very, very excited. You're gonna hear from a lot of really fantastic people. And I wanna make sure that I mention the young woman who is largely responsible for putting that together. Her name is Libby Malinchek. She is a student of Dr. Kathy Headley at Rockford University. So please, uh, I see Libby up there, take a bow. Please stand back and enjoy this uh, fantastic celebration of the Negro Leagues. And when we're done, we'll be back for more. International Women's Baseball Center's second annual conference. My name is Tom McMurra. I have the honor of being the mayor of the city of Rockford in Rockford, Illinois. Before I begin, I want to certainly say a huge thank you to the IWBC's Board of Directors. Thank you for your commitment and thank you for uplifting the voices and the work of so many amazing women who have come before us and who are the future generational leaders of our great country. I want to say a specific thank you to Dr. Cat Williams. Dr. Cat Williams, um, without your passion, without your dedication, without your commitment, we certainly would not be where we're at today, and we would not be looking for such a bright future. So thank you. This year is really important uh, for two big things. 
that I want to call out. One, it's a 100th anniversary of the Negro Leagues. That's an amazing thing to think about, 100 years. But what's also amazing is to think about the time to which we're celebrating this 100th anniversary. Right now, we're seeing civil unrest across the country and right here in Rockford, Illinois. Some could look at this as a challenge, look at this as being a really difficult time. I think we need to look at this as a tremendous opportunity. We are seeing younger people, we're seeing seniors, we're seeing people who are black, people who are white, people of different faiths coming together and voicing their concerns. This is an opportunity for all of us to come together, face the challenges that quite honestly we've avoided facing together for a decade, if not a century. So the second thing I'm really excited about is this year we're unveiling the second memorial and this memorial is to all of the, it's going to be dedicated to all the black women of baseball. It's coming at a perfect time. I am really excited. And I just want to say again, welcome to IWBC's second annual conference. I'm Congresswoman Sherry Bustos. Thank you for the opportunity to contribute to today's celebration and to be part of the second annual Women in Baseball Conference. Baseball has always played a pivotal role in the economic and social fabric of Rockford. I am so happy to honor the women who helped pave the way for me and for so many others. Baseball has been a very important part of my life for as long as I can remember. My late brother played minor league baseball, and he was the head baseball coach at Southern Illinois University and at Eastern Illinois University. And my father, he worked for Major League Baseball as its director of government relations. Many of my fondest memories were on a ball diamond. And as a member of Congress, one of my favorite events is playing shortstop in the annual Women's Congressional Softball Game. America's favorite pastime has a special way of bringing people together. And this year, I'm especially honored to celebrate the trailblazing contributions of African American men and women as part of the Negro League Center. Because of their groundbreaking efforts, they put breaking down barriers on center stage Women have come a long way, but we still have so much work to do. We must continue to fight for the protection of Title IX. And we must continue to fight for social justice to ensure that all of our future athletes have even more opportunities to pursue this sport as those who came before them. Thank you for the chance to celebrate this important chapter in American history. And as always, go Peaches! Hi, everybody. I'm Bob Kendrick, president of the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, as I proudly sit here in my office, literally a stone's throw away from the Facile YMCA, where on February 13, 1920, Andrew Rude Foster would lead a contingent of eight independent black baseball team owners into a meeting held at that historic landmark. Out of that meeting came the birth of the Negro National League the first successful organized black baseball league. The Negro Leagues would then go on to operate remarkably for 40 years, from 1920 until 1960, providing a much-needed playing ground for some of the greatest African-American and Hispanic athletes to showcase their world-class baseball abilities. There's no question that their passion for the game would change the game. But to merely reduce the story of the Negro Leagues to a baseball story would be doing a tremendous disservice to all who helped forge a glorious history in the midst of an inglorious time in American history. It is a story about an unprecedented level of leadership that emerged in the African American community as a result of the formation of those leagues. And ultimately, it is a story about the social advancement of America as Jackie Robinson is handpicked from the great Kansas City Five to break Major League Baseball's six-decade-long self-imposed color bill. Here at the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, we make the bold assertion that Robinson's breaking of the color bill wasn't just a part of the Civil Rights Movement. It was the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement in this country. This is 1947. This is well before those more noted civil rights occurrences. This is before Brown versus the Board of Education. This is before Rosa Parks refusing to move to the back of the bus. As 
my dear friend, the late, great John Buckle Neal was so eloquently say, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was only a sophomore at Morehouse College when Robinson signed that contract to play in the Dodgers organization. President Truman would not integrate the armed forces until a year after Jack. So for all intents and purposes, this is what started the fall of social progress growing in our country. Baseball. And our country literally jumped on the coattail of baseball. And so as the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum celebrates its 30th anniversary, we're so proud of the fact that we now provide a place where children can come and learn a story that many of us were never privy to during our own formal education. But they not only get the opportunity to learn it for its tremendous educational value, but also its very inspirational value. Because as I tell our guests all the time, if you walk away from this story with nothing other than this, what the Negro League teaches us is very simple. In this great country of ours, if you dare to dream and you believe in yourself, you can do or be anything you want to be. They dare to dream of playing the game of baseball. So on behalf of our team here at the Negro League Baseball Museum, I tip my cap to all who are participating in this great country. And we encourage you to continue to be a voice about this wonderful history so that the legacy of the Negro League will play on the I'm Judge Gwen Gully. And welcome to the 2020 International Women in Baseball Conference. This year, as we commemorate the centennial anniversaries of the Negro Leagues and women's suffrage movement, we must honor and recognize the legacies of those talented and courageous women who played pivotal roles in the fight for racial and gender equality. We stand on their shoulders, and we must continue to fight against injustice. Enjoy your conference, and again, welcome. I'm excited about the 100-year celebration of the Negro Baseball League. My name is Robin Robinson. I am first an educator, and I'm also a leader. I'm the current president of the Rockford Branch in NAACP, and a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, the Order of Eastern Stars, Women's March, Women's League, and a host of other organizations. Um, I'm so excited about this 100-year celebration of the Negro Baseball League. It makes me a better educator to make sure that I educate my students on this history and make sure that we encourage our youth to engage in baseball. We're having a virtual celebration that Dr. Williams and her committee has put together. I'm so excited. I'm just encouraging you all to come out and join us. Learn the history and share the history. Hi, my name is Marticia Brown with the Rockford Area Convention and Visitors Bureau. We are thrilled to welcome attendees virtually to the Rockford region for the Sabre Women in Baseball Conference hosted by Rockford University. Our community is truly honored to host this year's conference, which celebrates African American women in baseball as part of the 100th anniversary of the Negro Leagues. With a baseball heritage that includes the groundbreaking efforts of the Rockford Peaches, Rockford makes for the perfect destination to come together to highlight such important work. Thank you so much to Sabre, the International Women's Baseball Center, and Rockford University for your partnership in choosing our community for this year's conference host. Hi, my name is Byron Motley, and I want to say congratulations to the women in baseball for another great year and the great conference that you're doing this year. And I want to thank you for honoring the women of the Negro Leagues. And I'm wearing my Indianapolis Pals t-shirt in honor of the three women, Tony Stone, Connie Morgan, and Mamie Tina Johnson, who played in the Negro Leagues. I'm also wearing my Newark Eagles cap in honor of Effa Manley, the first and only woman inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. Again, I want to thank you for honoring these four women who gave a lot to the Negro Leagues and have a great conference, even if it is via Zoom. <laughs> and remember to keep the spirit alive of the Negro Leagues and always play ball.
Rosalind Stearns Brown in honor of my dad, Norman Turkey Stearns Baseball Hall of Fame in the Negro Leagues, honoring them in their 100th anniversary celebration. Hello everyone, this is Claire Smith with ESPN. I am so proud to be a part of this recognition of the Negro Leagues on the occasion of the centennial. The men and women who played baseball in our communities made it possible for the game to thrive long enough to be invited into the American community. I'm especially proud to honor the women of the Negro Leagues. Effa Manley, a Hall of Famer, and the owner of the uh, Newark Eagles, and an innovator way before her time, as well as players Tony Stone, Connie Morgan, and Mamie Peanut Johnson, whose jersey I hold here. Ladies, you did us proud, and we thank you, and the gentlemen that you helped make baseball great. My name is Harriet Kimbrough Hamilton, and my dad, Henry Kimbrough, oh. was a Negro leaguer, and we are very proud of that. That's but great. I am especially proud of those African-American women who were team owners, players, and coaches in the league. Ladies, you rock. Hi, everyone. My name is Henrietta Dotson Williams. In 1973, I became the first African-American woman to be elected to the Winnebago County Board of Commissioners. During my tenure, I led the successful effort to make Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday a county holiday. It is a great honor for me to congratulate and recognize the centennial celebration of the Negro Baseball League, 100 years of women's suffrage, the contributions of African-American women in professional baseball, and establishing the International Women's Baseball Center here in Rockford, Illinois. It is so important for us to preserve our history and to make sure the next generation is well equipped to continue our rich legacy. Hi, I'm Duke Goldman, tipping my cap to the rich history and phenomenal players in the Negro Leagues and paying tribute to Effa Manley, the first and so far only woman in the Hall of Fame, hopefully one of the many more to come. I tip my cap to the Negro Leagues and I say thank you to the men and women whose lives and stories I now study, embrace, and share. And thank you to the Negro Leaguers whom I've been privileged to meet your dignity and your grace have overwhelmed me. Thank you, and happy 100th. Hi, I'm Jim Overmeyer. The Negro Leagues were the foundation for the entry of blacks into integrated professional baseball. Given the enormous successes of black American and Caribbean players since 1947, you could say they were a foundation of modern Major League Baseball itself. On behalf of the African American Resource Center at Booker, we celebrate 100 years of Negro Leagues and commemorate all of Rockford's African American Church Leagues. Thank you. Have a wonderful conference.
pleasure to celebrate with you the centennial of the Negro Leagues. I'm excited to be a part of this event to recognize the contribution of so many to the history of these leagues. The game today owes so much to all who played and worked in the shadows of segregation. I am especially excited to share with you today the unheralded contributions and stories of the women who have always been a part of the game with the Negro Leagues, but also before their existence and after. What I will be sharing is just a little of this story to hopefully pique your interest to go out and learn more. And so where this story usually begins when we think about African-American women and their participation in professional or organized baseball is with a team called the Dolly Vardens. The Dolly Vardens played in the Philadelphia area in the 1880s, 1883, 1884. And in actuality, we know there were two Dolly Varden teams, the Dolly Varden ones and the Dolly Vardens two. Uh, this book cover that you see here presented to you is the only thing that's ever really been written about. It's coming out later this year. Very excited to hear and share this story. Dolly Vardens played mostly men's teams, but also another team in the Philadelphia area, African-American women called the Captain Capes. And they were a professional team. They were paid for what they were doing. And so this is really the beginning. You'll see a little bit in the picture on the cover there of the type of style of uniform that they were wearing. Unfortunately, we don't know a great deal about the Dolly Varden teams, simply because of the nature of newspaper coverage at the time. Um, for all women's sports, women were kept out um, of any particular sport just simply because uh, they were the weaker sex. This was not something women were supposed to be doing. But this is where the, the stories begin. And so we look to the Dolly Bartons, and then we jump ahead uh, to give you a little bit of thinking about teams. Um, another team that we know something about is this picture here. They are the St. Louis Black Broncos playing in around 1910 to about 1912 around the St. Louis area, but they also traveled throughout the Midwest playing women's teams and men's teams. And you will notice in this picture a typical thing for a lot of older teams that there were generally men on the team as well. And so you can see that in the picture. The idea typically was the pitcher and the catcher would be male and the rest of the team um, would be women. And so you can see that here. And so the St. Louis Black Broncos, owned by Conrad Cooper, played for a couple of seasons. The picture on the opposing side is a YWCA team from the 1920s, another place where women got the opportunity to participate in all kinds of sports, not just baseball. And so this is a picture you will see often of the YWAC teams um, that created their own leagues, uh, both in the Midwest and also on the West Coast. We know, for example, California, that that was true. There were a number of rumor teams, white and black, playing all over the country from the early 1900s all the way into the 1940s. Um, we have the Baltimore Black Sox Bloomer Girls uh, that were playing in the 19-teens and 1920s. Sure, we have the Detroit Colored Bloomer Girls, we have the Athenas, we have the Hot Rockets out of Texas. There are and the list goes on and on. Unfortunately, in most cases, we know very little today yet about those teams. Lots of history to be built in, but what it shows you is this is a story that just skimmed the top. Okay? Um, we think about owners. We think about Ethel Manley, who was elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame in 2006. Her ownership of the Newark Eagles with her husband, A. team that they were involved with from 1936 to or selling the team in 1948, winning a Negro League World Series during that period, having numerous Hall of Famers, and also using her position to do a great deal of civic engagement and social work in the community. Posting don't buy where you can't work campaigns, anti-lynching campaigns at the ballpark. Um, and so Effa currently is the only woman elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame. Seated on the opposing side is Vinnie Forbes, the only owner still living from the Negro League period, 
Mitty was the owner of the Detroit Stars in 1956, later um, played for the Kansas City Monarchs, a little bit of the third base, the hot one. Um, and this is Mitty depicted at a Negro Leagues reunion hosted by the Detroit Tigers. Um, Mitty and Effa are just again to the iceberg. We think about owners and others who have worked for teams. And so give you a little bit more of that and a few more names to think about. When we think of Effa, the first to own a Negro League team was actually Olivia Taylor, pictured on the left. Olivia Taylor, wife of very well-known C.I. Taylor, Indianapolis ABCs, when her husband passed away, Olivia took over the team in the early 1920s, 1922 to 24. Um, the Taylor family was very involved in baseball. And so Olivia owned the team. CI's brother Ben managed. And in addition to being very involved with the team, Olivia was also very involved with the local and national NAACP. Clara Jones, president of the semi-pro independent team, Boston ABCs in 1935, owned by uh, Club Mac. Highly respected, well-written about team in Boston and surrounding area. Ethel Posey, Ethel Truman Posey, wife of Cumberland Posey, served as an officer and then when her husband passed away along with Helen Jackson, Rufus Jackson was Posey's partner, they kept the team until they sold in the, after a year or two, Hilda Bolton Shorter. Hilda Bolton Shorter is the daughter of Ed Bolton with the Philadelphia Stars. And in addition to inheriting the team from her father, she also was an accomplished pianist and a doctor who traveled to Africa, for example, to have a host a concert to raise money for hospitals. Henry and Green inherited Baltimore Eagle by Giants from her husband, Vernon, in the late 1940s, and then Will sold that team. The other picture there in the center is Gertrude Willis Geddes from New Orleans, who is better known for the start of a still existing funeral home franchise in the area. Uh, very well respected, very well known in that business. But in the 1930s, she served as treasurer for the New Orleans Black Pelicans. Um, and that is the team later on that Tony Stone will play with for a period of time when she first moved. These are just a few of the women who have played various roles with Eagle League teams over the years. When we think of the players in the Negro Leagues, the three that always come to mind are Tony Stone, Mamie Johnson, and Connie Morgan, pictured here, playing in the 1950s for the Indianapolis Clowns, and Tony also played for the Kansas City Monarchs. Maybe people know, maybe a little better, because recently she had an opportunity to meet Monet Davis, or Monet Davis had the opportunity to meet her. Monet Davis, of course, pitching in the Little League World Series, and so the two pitchers got a chance to share their stories and share their history, and maybe to be an inspiration for the young ladies today. Tony, Connie, and Mamie are not the only women who play on Negro League teams. We can add to those people like Isabel Baxter, Pearl Barnett, Harriet Smith, Desiree Robinson. So there are others who got the chance to play within the Negro Leagues in more recent history. We can look to the Colorado Silver Bullets and the USA national team. So Tamara Holmes and Lika Underwood both played for many years for the USA national team in the World Cup since 2006, contributing in infielders and outfield team. Charlotte Wiley played for the Colorado Silver Bullets women's professional team in the 1990s. And so 
you see the contributions continuing right up to the present day in the game of baseball in a variety of areas. More recently, we would add to the list, this list of people, Elaine Weddington Stewart, assistant GM for the Boston Red Sox, or Claire Smith, winner of the J.G. Taylor Spink Award from the Baseball Writers Association, currently writing in about baseball, Shakia Taylor, women working for Major League Baseball and for Minor League Baseball, people like Jakara Ware, Nicole Whiteman, Lonnie Murray, and again, that list continues. And so this is just a little bit of what we are celebrating today as part of this bigger picture of celebrating the Negro Leagues. And so I hope I piqued your interest, but I just want to end by saying congratulations for this celebration. May the history never be forgotten. Thank you. The study of the Negro Leagues after a baseball-obsessed youth broadened my perspectives and enriched my life. I salute the Negro Leagues on their centennial. The great teams and great players and their powerful history in a flawed society. Hello, this is Larry Lester. I bring you greetings from Sabres Negro Leagues Research Committee. Congratulations on your event celebrating African American women in baseball. I tip my hat in honor of these women who broke the gender barrier in black baseball. Tony Stone, Mamie Johnson, Connie Morgan, Desiree Robinson, and Doris Jackson. Along with high praise to Hall of Fame inductee and team owner Effa Manley, plus other lady executives in the Negro Baseball Leagues. Have a great conference. Amy Johnson was not only a great athlete, but a spectacular human being. I think her sincerity is what I admired most in her. I had the opportunity to work with her on two occasions. In 2003, she accepted my invite to come to the sixth annual Jerry Malloy Conference. It was in Harrisburg that year. And her appearance on City Island, uh, there's people still talk about who were there. Uh, six years later, I was asked to host a player panel at the Washington Sabre Conference. And she was the first player that I thought to invite. It wasn't a mistake. Once again, she was the hit of that panel. So, for these two occasions and any other interaction I had with Mamie, I'm very grateful to have known her and happy to talk about her in this brief little video. So thanks, Leslie, for asking me, and I hope I've done Mamie justice. As the granddaughter of Negro Leagues legend, Norman Turkey Stearns, I'm tipping my cap to all of the incredible Negro Leaguers today and always. As a woman coaching a boys basketball team, I know I stand on the shoulders of the sensational women who played in the Negro Leagues, like Tony Stone and Peanut Johnson. The women of the Negro Leagues pioneered to show us who we are, what we are made of, and continue to light our path. Thank you for your courage. We won't let you down. Peace and love, Vanessa Ivy Rose. Peanut Johnson, Tony Stone, and Tiny Warner, three brave women who both gender and racial barriers and play in the Negro League with the amazing Josh Gibson, Satchel Page, Buck O'Neill, Oscar Charleston, Ron Beasley, and my father, Norman Turkey Stein, and all of the players who were denied their right to play in history. We celebrate you during this centennial anniversary year of the Negro League. Well done. Charles Young, Charles Collectibles and Books, celebrating black ladies, African-American ladies in baseball. Tony Stone, Connie Morgan and Mamie Peanut Johnson. I was fortunate to meet Connie Morgan and Mamie Johnson at the 75th anniversary in Kansas City, Missouri, and Tony Stone in uh, 1993 at the Secaucus New, New Jersey Meadowlands show. I also uh, want to salute uh, Minnie Forbes as being the only uh, woman uh, to own the Detroit Stars. Hats off. Thank you. I'm at the Peach Orchard, adjacent to the future home of the International Women's Baseball Center and Museum, to tip my cap for the 100th anniversary of the Negro Leagues and to honor the men and women on the field, in the front office, and in the stands. I 
tip my cap to you. I tip my cap and my Negro League shirt in honor of the centennial celebration of the founding of the Negro Leagues of Baseball. 100 years ago, what a remembrance. What a salute. What an experience. To all the players, men and women, owner, promoter, contributors, everyone involved, I see you. I remember you. I honor you. And I thank you. I'm Sherman Jenkins, author of this book, Ted Strong Jr., Negro League All-Star. And I'm here joining countless others in recognizing the 100-year anniversary of the Negro Leagues by tipping my hat to men like Ted and others who made the Negro Leagues great. Hi, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that wonderful celebration of the Negro Leagues. As most of you know, the long-term goal of the IWBC is to build an educational center and a museum right here in Rockford, Illinois. But before the first shovel is even put into the ground, we want to make sure that we do everything in our power to educate and bring the, the long history of girls and women in baseball to the forefront. One way we're doing that is by building an outdoor museum. This outdoor museum will consist of nine separate pylons or memorials, each one dedicated to an individual or a group of people or an organization that has been important in the history of girls and women in the game. Last year, the first memorial was dedicated to the Penny Marshall. Penny Marshall, as you know, was the director of the movie A League of Their Own. That movie put the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League and the Rockford Peaches on the map. It's fitting that Penny has a memorial here at the home of the Rockford Peaches. This year, we unveil our second pylon. Through scholarship and retold stories from generation to generation, through movies and photographs, we know that women and girls have always played the game. But in most written history, most stories that are retold and most movies that are made, women of color have, have simply been ignored or given a cursory nod. That stops now. What they did, what they do matters. Their legacy is our legacy. And until women of color are given the acknowledgement and the honor they deserve in the game of baseball, what we think we know about the game of baseball and girls and women's participation in it is simply wrong. This year, with this second pylon dedication, and in the year when we celebrate the centennial of the Negro Leagues, we take a big step in memorializing black girls and women in the game of baseball. It is my honor to unveil the only design ever dedicated to the long and illustrious history of black girls and women in baseball. You're back, Cat. You're you're muted. You can't unmute yourself. There we go. Cat okay. Kathy was trying to keep me silent. Cat, um, do you want me to show the pylon in a big way? I've got uh, the. That would be great. Um, 
please put the uh, for everyone uh, who's who's still listening. Uh, uh, Leslie's going to put the design for the second memorial uh, up again. So um, and then we'll uh, we'll do another little introduction. So yeah, Leslie, that'd be great. The way you can see it a little closer. Um, Leslie um, uh, had a had a huge hand in uh, working with our designer, by the way. Um, and uh, as you can see, um, there are a lot of um, African American women from um, every phase of baseball. Um, Mamie. can't beat that quote, right? Thank you, Leslie. Uh, that is, as we said, the second of nine uh, pylons for the Outdoor Museum uh, next year is uh, a secret but uh, I hope you'll join us when we unveil that one as well. Um, that was an amazing video. Uh, it was an amazing um, nod uh, to the Negro Leagues. And I want to personally thank every single one of you who participated and uh, worked hard to put that together. Um, one, of the, one of the just amazing things we get to do at this conference is we get to be part of the announcement of Sabre's Dorothy Award. Uh, and I am going to uh, introduce and then turn it over to Leslie Heapy, who is the chair of the Women in Baseball Committee for Sabre. Um, and I know I told you guys yesterday, if you were here when I gave you the, when I gave the intro to the conference, I told you, you're gonna hear the name of Leslie Heapy a lot. Um, Leslie uh, would probably be the first one to say, no, this isn't true. But I, I want to take every opportunity to thank her and to say that uh, this has been an amazing two days. And uh, tomorrow will be equally amazing. And that is due largely to Leslie. So thank you. We, we are honored at the IWBC to have you on our board, and we really appreciate it. Uh, Leslie, as you know, is also a professor at Kent State Stark, uh, in addition to being uh, virtually the ever-ready bunny when it comes to uh, planning and, and putting these things together. And uh, so, Leslie? Well, thanks, Kat. And I just want to say this has been phenomenal. And this, as you saw, can't be done without a village of uh, uh, I don't know, huge numbers of people that make this possible to allow us to tip our caps to the Negro Leagues and to everybody. Um, and now we're going to um, add to the great celebration that's going on tonight. Um, in my role as the chair of the Women in Baseball Committee for Sabre, uh, in 2017, our committee got together and decided that we wanted to create an award that would recognize contributions made and so we created the Dorothy Seymour Mills Lifetime Achievement Award with the first award presented in 2018. It was created to recognize the lifetime of contributions as a woman in baseball or to, to women's baseball. It was named for our historian, writer, and researcher, Dorothy Seymour Mills, who passed away just this past November. So she was able to see our first two presentations. Uh, Dorothy, known best for working on a three volume series on baseball history, but wrote so much more and always was a huge presence and a huge inspiration to those of us um, 
within Saber and within the women's baseball uh, community. Before I turn it over for the presentation, I just want to say we recognize and are so proud of the six finalists chosen for this year. They were Justine Siegel from Baseball for All, architect extraordinaire Janet Marie Smith, owner Effa Manley, sports writer Claire Smith, player Tony Stone, and umpire Amanda Clement. And to present this year's award, I'm going to introduce you to the inaugural winner of the Dorothy, and that was umpire extraordinaire Perry Barber. And so I'm going to turn it over to Perry. Okay, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we, yes, we can hear you, Perry. All right, now I can hear you too. Okay, thank you so much, Leslie and Kat and everybody involved in setting up this conference and making it a reality. It's it been extraordinary and a lot of us have done these saber conferences and they just keep getting better and better and the support of saber for iwbc's dream of, of putting this conference together has been so integral to its success so thank you very much saber and rockford university also i think if dorothy were with us she would be amazed and typically modest about her own contribution to these proceedings. And I, I was lucky enough to know her as many of us were. And I think that the idea of having such a prestigious award named after her made her a little bit uncomfortable, but also made her extremely proud. And I have to tell you that the, one of the proudest moments of my life came the evening I was at the Nine Conference in Arizona two years ago when my name was announced as, as the inaugural winner. And what made it so special was not just the idea of, of being recognized for what I've been doing for 40 years, which is basically having fun and avoiding getting a real job. But apparently it's made a larger impression than that. But the fact that Dorothy was right there in the room with me, beside me, that when I heard my name, I could turn around and look at her and see the look on her face. And, uh, well, there was crying in baseball that night, and there is tonight, too, as you can see. And I'm not embarrassed about it. Dorothy was really, really special, and she set a standard for baseball research and basically created an industry that is the lifeblood of all of us here. Even if we don't actively do the research, we appreciate it and we benefit from it for, uh, because of the people like Leslie and Kat and all of the amazing presenters here have done just totally phenomenal. So I am going to show you the trophy I'm just going to hold a, an image of it up to my camera so you can see how lovely the trophy is. That's a, an image. And now you're going to get to see the actual thing, the award that I was given in 2018, which I treasure and carry with me everywhere um, because I'm certainly not shy about displaying it and telling people how wonderful Dorothy was and how fortunate I am to have been the first Dorothy Award winner. And it gives me great pleasure and tremendous honor and privilege to announce this year's winner of the Lifetime Achievement Award for Women in Baseball, tenderly and lovingly nicknamed the Dorothy, to this year's winner, who is probably 
the second most mentioned woman during this conference after Leslie Heafy, and that is the late, great Effa Manley. And I can think of no more fitting winner than Effa Manley for this special conference and this special award. And notwithstanding the uh, merits of the other candidates who are all just completely phenomenal, but they're not dead. Um, they have other chances and they will get their days in the sun, I have no doubt. And I also have no doubt that they are as thrilled for EFA as I am and as probably all of us are. So thank you so much, Leslie and Kat and Jacob and Tracy for taking such good care of Dorothy after she made the move from Florida to Tucson. I know that you helped her set, set up in her new apartment and looked after her and treated her as if she were a member of your own family and, and there's no way of thanking you for that. So just full of gratitude for this evening and this weekend and IWBC and SABER and everybody that's been here with us through this amazing journey of discovery. So thank you. Thanks, Leslie. Thanks, Kat. Thank you so much, Perry. And I think it would be fitting at this time, and I'm just kind of doing this impromptu, but I would love if everybody would turn on their cameras. If everybody could do that now, because I just think it will be. And if you, if you, you can either do this figuratively, literally, however you want to do it, but I think we need to do two things. And that would be, if you have a cap, we're going, and momentarily we will tip our caps and then you can unmute yourself for a moment so that we can clap or cheer for both our Negro League celebration and for Effa Manley. So if everybody would like to, we're going to take a moment and simply recognize this incredible celebration and as a group, tip our caps to the Negro Leagues, all the men, women, and their history and stories. And then if you would take a moment to unmute yourself because I think it'll be awesome to hear. I think everybody can, can they all unmute yourselves or do we have to do it for them? Oh, shoot. we have to uh, unmute all, wait here. Did I unmute everybody? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Uh, yes, most of, it, looks like, it looks like it worked for most everybody. I don't know why it didn't work for a few. I don't know why it didn't work for you, Tara, because most everybody it did. Oh, there you are, Tara. Okay. So I just thought you could either, I just thought we would give uh, an opportunity altogether to say clap and say congratulations, because I just think that's to, to everybody that. Thanks, everybody. Now I'm going to mute you all again. Sorry. <laughs> All right, now I'm going to turn it back over to Kat. Oh, you can't unmute yourself. Uh, no, I can't unmute yourself. There you are, Kat. Uh, now, I am going to cheer because I was muted during the cheers. <laughs> I don't know what. Sorry about that, Kat. <laughs> it's really okay. Uh, I just want to thank everyone. Uh, this has been an absolutely amazing day and evening and we're not done yet but um i believe we have um i believe we have a a, a few minutes yet uh before uh the in fact i'm not sure leslie how much uh we're, well we, we we left as much open time as we needed because okay. what comes next is just for anybody who wants to stay right we're gonna have we're going to talk baseball and we're going to talk research and your projects and just, right. uh, so you can stick around. That's that. So we're, on, okay. we're on no time frame, Kat. Okay, good. Uh, so, uh, then, uh, Leslie, I think kind of spelled out what we're doing. This is a sort of a free time. Um, and, uh, we have had some amazing presentations. Uh, we have learned so much and, uh, we learned a lot in this video. And uh, if there are questions or comments or if anyone would like to talk about their research, and certainly 
Um, if you have questions about the IWDC and our uh, outdoor museum, if you have uh, comments, uh, or if you'd like to know more about um, our plans moving forward, we'll also talk about that as well. So um, assuming that uh, I'm not muted again, we'll, uh, we'll have that conversation. So uh, anyone who is, uh, has something to say, comment or question. And uh, Leslie, if you had something more uh, specific planned in terms of your own research, by all means. Nope, that was, this. we figured at this point, it's an opportunity for those right. who say, you know, I'm, I'm good for the night, but I, or you want to stick around, this was just going to be an open opportunity to have this discussion in any way it takes us. And I will help to moderate that, to help point to people with questions. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is an opportunity to really what we really wanted to do was to give people, and I've already had a couple people ask me, are we going to get a chance to talk and ask questions about how to do research, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, uh, yeah, I, that's, I what, that's what we're looking forward to. Is this, is this also known as happy hour? Yes, it was also, I was going <laughs> to announce to anybody who wants to, this is our, uh, uh, this uh, is our uh, chance to 